Creating content as a business owner is no longer a nice to have. It's an essential part of your business growth. And that's what Paul Sweeney is using his podcast for whilst providing an evergreen go-to resource for entrepreneurs worldwide. Join me as we dive into the journey of Paul's podcast, The Business Behind Your Business. In this episode, you'll learn how to leverage your podcast to grow your business, how Paul streamlined his workflow to reduce it from several days per episode to several hours, the difference between a hobby podcast and a business podcast, how to treat your content creation as a business and avoid podcast burnout and so much more. If you're a podcaster and also a business owner, then this is the perfect episode for you. Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining me on Podcasting Amplified. How are you doing today? Uh, fantastic. It's great to be here. Great. So Paul Sweeney joins me today. He's the host of The Business Behind Your Business, and he and his team of expert advisors take a deep dive into the problems and solutions faced by business owners. And it's been going for around four years now. Is that right? Yes, certainly. Uh, four years. It feels like that, and um, it's been it's been a journey. And uh, the the businesses that we've been sort of trying to reach out to have gone through a journey in the last four years, particularly. And um, that that's why we've we why we have the podcast, why we have the business behind your business, um, to help those business owners go through that journey and and come out the other side stronger and healthier. So was it originally for clients of yours or was it also i guess to attract new business as well look there were probably many different well a number of different aspects to it one was for clients but the second thing was um yeah a lot of small business owners so we are targeting that small medium business owner and often they don't have resources they're often the one man band so they don't have your hr department your it your legal your marketing and they're doing a lot by themselves so our aim was to get um, advice out to those people um, in a format that they could easily digest that didn't cost them, um, prompt them on what they need to do next and, and provide some really tangible resources and, and input into how they can grow their business and also make them not feel alone. So when we started the podcast, we were just, uh, I guess, probably in, in, in Sydney, we were in the second lockdown um, of COVID and uh, it was after the first lockdown and we got together with um, our referral network and, and a group of our advisory board who provide that kind of service to our clients here. Um, but we looked at how could we actually expand what we're doing and, and help more people because during COVID we had a lot of people reaching out um, who may not necessarily be the right client for my business but we still wanted to help them in, in any way we could. So we've tried to, uh, well, we initially we started with that, that panel of our advisory board, uh, providing most of the content, and we've expanded that as we've, as we've gone. And, and during that peak period, we, we increased the frequency of the podcast to try and get as much helpful content out to business owners around the world. Um, we have a focus on, on Australia, but uh, what we've seen is that um, our listening uh, audience is, all, is worldwide. So um, we try to get as much content out as possible to help people during that, that peak um, period of need. But um, at the same time, er most of the episodes we, we come up with, most of the conversations we have um, are what we call evergreen. So they're just as relevant today as they were when we first recorded it. And, you know, in any any period we look back and we say, well, hang on, people are still downloading and listening to episode two um, and we're up to episode 130 now. So we, we, it's good to see that it's still a helpful and useful resource to uh, business owners everywhere. Yeah, that's great. So how have things sort of changed in terms of what you're getting out of the podcast over the last few years? What, what have you found to be the benefits and have, have they changed over the last four years? Yeah, I, th I think the benefits have changed from it being uh, known as somebody that's trying something a little bit quirky, something a bit different to uh, really somebody that's actually providing some valuable content and a, a good resource. But hey, if they're providing that content a, a, at a high level for their listeners, then yeah, the feedback or the, the tie back to our core business is that we must be doing something really good with our clients as well. So there is that, that, that um, I guess, uh, the win situation there, but we, we are expanding our reach and I think we've, we've matured. Um, I'm glad to say that um, 
how we've gone about doing the podcast for our current episodes is not the same as we were when we first started. We were very green and we were excited and we just, I guess, ploughed in a bit. We, we did some research when we ploughed in, but we still found we were spending a lot of time learning the trade, uh, whereas now we've got quite a good process and we can con concentrate more on getting um i, I guess uh making sure we, that we get a, a good source of information some good guests on with some um some good background experience and and helpful content for for listeners uh rather than just um thinking oh we've got to get another episode out let's just get something there which mm -hmm. uh, sometimes when you're busy you get into that that trap of just putting out content without thinking about how's it really going to benefit your listener yeah yeah it definitely takes a good 50 plus episodes to get into the the real swing of it and yeah, i've noticed absolutely. that well like you say you you do interview episodes with with your team um and also you've got solo episodes now as well so i guess that helps keep that cadence going if you can't find the right um guest so are the, are the solo episodes quite recent then because I, I listened to one of your recent episodes and it was a solo episode um but is that more of a recent thing uh, look, I think the solo episodes are interspersed. Um, uh, we like to have a good, a good lineup and a consistent lineup of guests. Um, uh, uh, you, yeah, we try to have that conversation style, which is from as a listener, I find that more engaging and to have those conversations between people. Um, but where we've had, um, you know, uh, an inability to to get consistent guests lined up, um, you know, I'm, from my experience as an accountant and a business advisor, uh, there are a lot of topics that I can talk on. So I, I will jump into there uh, as the expert there. Um, given that, yeah, we've got an, a, a panel of um, experts that we we tend to um, rely on, um, and uh, in that pool, that that advisory board, I'm the accountant and the business advisor. So. Yeah, I'm filling the gap with those topics um, as they're needed, and and some some of the more timely ones. So coming up to end of year, when we're looking at reviewing the year that was, or or maybe planning the year ahead, when what we're going to do, uh, they they fall into under my skill set. So happy to d jump in on those. But occasionally uh, we will get somebody else uh, to reverse the um, the roles and interview me and ask me questions about um, accounting and 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 uh, strategy for business. So. Yeah, I, I I enjoy the conversations more than the solo episodes. Um, okay. I, I, there's still something strange after all this time of talking to a camera uh, <laughs> with nobody on the other side of it. So, oh yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. I I uh, I do content for YouTube um, on my own, so I've kind of gotten used to that now. But I do know what you mean. Um, having that conversation, it sort of keeps it moving forward, and I find yeah, when you're on your own kind of run out of things to say if it's not completely scripted how mm. how how much do you put into the planning of the solo episodes do you just put bullet points together or do you script the whole thing uh, i generally have a bullet point outline because I, I tend to on on some subjects i can get very excited and probably a little bit carried away and go off tangent uh go um go off on a, a tangent and and just want to keep adding something else but uh, the bullet points help me uh focus on um just making it a concise message because often uh you know we want to keep it to a, a digestible amount of time that you're listening to it um we don't want it to turn into a, like a 90 minute lecture mm. um but it just needs to be something digestible so we're aiming for like 15 to 25 minutes um sometimes more sometimes less um often the more engaging ones we tend to let them go a bit longer um but some of the drier subjects that well, well, accounting can be a bit dry, so I try and keep those ones a bit shorter and, and stick to the points there. But, you know, I, I do, I do um, like to have that guide. Um, and even when we're doing the, the, comp, the, the interviews, I tend to have a couple of key questions that I want to cover with, um, yeah. with the guest. Um, but it's not a case of me asking, say, okay, right, question one, question two, question three. We try to make it like it's two people having a conversation and I, I just make sure that I remember to, to steer the conversation so that we answer those three key questions that we wanted to address when we were planning the episode. Yeah, I, I listened to the seven steps to business success and it did seem quite focused. Um, is it edit, edited particularly heavily at all or do you do the editing? Well, fortunately, I don't do the editing anymore. Mm. <laughs> we've we've now um, that got that into a process, and my assistant um, does a fantastic job um, taking care of that. Um, but uh, I think um, 
a lot of those, the accounting and business topics are, are conversations or, or topics that I'm, I'm quite familiar with and I've delivered a, a number of times to my clients um, or, or to um, um, networking groups that I'm part of. Um, so I do have them uh, fairly concise. Um, so we don't do a lot of editing. Um, there, there's been the odd occasion where Anne just said, no, I'm cutting that out because you just repeated yourself. So um, she does a good job. She knows, um, you know, how, how to put me in line and how to how to cut back when it needs to be done. But a lot of the time we try not to over edit um, because I, I just think it comes across a bit more natural. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, otherwise, um, I, I don't like reading speeches and, and I'm not good at writing speeches because even when I write a speech, I tend to go off my um, my pre-prepared content and, and just stick to, um, yeah, what I know. Yeah. Yeah, and it can sound... Um you know, even more dry if you're just reading from a script, basically. Yeah. But even your yeah. interviews seem quite concise as well, because I, I know when you're doing solo episodes, you feel like sometimes you can just rush through it. Like you've, it's, you just kind of ream off what you're going to say, but then within interview episodes, it can take all sorts of turns. But they seem to be, you know, in that sort of 20 to 30 minutes range. Was that always the plan to keep those concise as well? And And how do you manage to keep your interviews focused on the, the mm. key topics? Yeah, look, uh, always the plan to keep it to about 15 to 25 minutes. So it's that digestible amount. Um, and it and look, when I'm listening to podcasts, that's probably the length of time that I like to listen to any one topic. Um, but when we're planning, it would tend to go through like one core um, or one key theme that we want to talk about in that episode and then what are the three points and make it very clear from the beginning that this is the length of content that we're looking for and if it's a case of um, we've got a lot of content and it's going to be too long what we might look at doing with that guest is say hey instead of it doing it as one episode we might break it up and do it as two or three and, and make it a, a little mini series uh, or even get them back to to spin, um, to uh, perhaps um, go into a bit more depth in something they've they've raised during that. So um, what I've often done is um, during the conversation, an idea will come up, and I think, well, that would be actually be that that point alone would be something really worthwhile visiting um, and sharing in more depth with our our listeners. So um, I tend to invite that person back, uh, and we'll and specifically to go on to that content. Um, and revisit it and, and go into that in a bit more depth rather than abandoning the, the, the main theme of what we were talking about during the, the initial planning or the initial conversation. Yeah, cool, that makes sense. And you said in your application that you've got it down to sort of a few hours rather than a few days per episode mm. and you mentioned the tools you've used to get it to that point. Do you think there's also something to do with sort of the the mindset of it as well because you said you had to listen to each episode quite a few times at the start do you find that there's something to do with just being more comfortable with getting yourself out there or is it um, are you quite the perfectionist when it comes to your episodes then I think I've got more comfortable and I think I've got more comfortable with hearing myself make mistakes yeah because uh, it's not a per no episode is perfect um, and often I'll listen to something uh, after we've published it and I think, oh, I could have done that better or I would have liked to have gone down a different um, different angle on that question. Um, but I think getting comfortable with not being perfect um, because uh, like if you're waiting till you're perfect, you're not going to hit record, you're not going to hit publish. So I think we've well, I've got more accepting of it. And also we had somebody else doing the editing. They're not as um, finicky about how you sound and some of the some of the I, I guess they're not as um, worried so much about my ego uh, as I would be when I'm editing it so um, that's that's been really helpful and, and then of course you know um, using some of the AI tools that we've we're now using in the editing process just really streamlines those things because uh, I was looking for you know in the past you'd look for like filler words and so where somebody would go um 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 and you'd try and find that and find the exact moment to delete it and then you'd listen back to it to hear how it sounded after you'd edited it uh, whereas now we're using um uh we're using um descript for doing yeah. our editing and so editing the audio is is a lot like editing a, a word document so that is a lot close 
closer. So, yeah, originally we were using Audacity um, for doing all our editing and you couldn't see the words. So you had to get familiar with, oh, I guess, what the sounds looked like. And, and that. so uh, as a shortcut, then I would send those raw files off for transcription um, and then because that would help me sort of pinpoint where I had to go to. So that saved a bit of time. But then when we came across Descript um, and we could do that all in there, it did the transcription for us. It just saved a lot of time. Um, and then even before that, like the different audio quality. So one of the things that we discovered early on is that I would interview a guest and like I might have my sound set up quite well for podcasting, but the person I'm interviewing, they might not be used to interviewing and they might have a, like a uh, um, pretty much just a, a, a very basic microphone yeah, and the, phone the, or the kids are in the background on yeah. uh, in the kitchen, which often happened during COVID. Um, where, whereas uh, the tool we're using for recording online, um, so we, we, we've been using Zencaster, uh, it does some great work. It takes a lot of that audio engineering and sound engineering out of my hands. It will get rid of a lot of the background noise. It will um, level the different volumes of different speakers. So if we've got two or three people on, on, the, on the interview, um, often they will come in at different um, volumes in just the way that they speak. Um, so that takes a lot of that out of, the, out of our hands and, and by the time we bring that, that file into the script, a lot of the engineering's already been done and it's a much better product at, at the end. So if you listen to the sound quality and I, I, I had um, one of my musician clients uh, on who has very got a very good ear and understands sound quality and yeah it's nice when they say look the quality of the audio has really improved from mm -hmm. day one to, to where you're at now um, and look with podcast it is audio based and I have um, you know I've listened to a few podcasts where the audio hasn't been great and it's been a struggle it's been hard work to listen to so getting that audio quality correct has been um, yeah, uh, pretty important um, because if the audio quality is not there, nobody's going to listen. Keep listening to to what your interview is. So you might have a great, um, a great show, great content to share with people that's really helpful. But if the if they're struggling to hear it, they're not going to keep listening. Yeah, there, there's too many podcasts out there now in any particular niche where you can really get away with with bad audio because audio, there's just going to be another one that they can they can just jump to with with much more pleasant experience and yeah audacity quite a tricky one to start with like it's really popular because it's free and it works on every system but yeah if you don't spend a long and it's a long time with it and it's not the fastest in terms of that kind of dedicated audio software anyway but yeah descript um good to know that that's helping you and yeah you say about um you know just having to get it out there eventually because you know you're recording an episode every week or every other week you're going to get better just from exposure but i think it can go the other way sometimes where m maybe you know it is good to have some level even right at the start some level of um you know a, a kind of benchmark that you do want to get the quality of the podcast to because again, so many podcasts out there, and yeah, you start to get complacent if you just re release any old thing. Yeah, yeah, I think before I started recording podcasts, one of the things I did do was I would run, um, uh, I would run a lot of webinars where I planned to not have anybody on the webinar, and the only people on it would be my team. And what we would do is we'd get used to the idea of, of, of speaking like we're talking to ourselves. Um, but the feedback when we reviewed the content there would be, you know, how clear are we? Um, what sorts of things are we doing that are sort of, you know, making it hard to listen to? Are we repeating ourselves? Uh, you know, do we need more structure and more prompting in terms of our notes, our points um, to follow? So going through that exercise of, of just even recording, um, recording video of myself talking and playing that back and hearing how fluid it was and how um, whether there was a flow to the content um, before we even launched the podcast, um, that, that's been helpful. Um, so mm. I think, you know, you, 
don't all like it, particularly early on if you try and just record your first one you're never going to be happy with it um, but it's good to just start with something short and just get used to that whole idea of talking into a microphone because it is still hard for a lot of people and um, you know listen to yourself play it back and, and also get some feedback from somebody um, that's going to be honest with you but not harsh not too harsh because you want, you want some encouragement there um, but having that feedback um, um, is helpful and um, yeah look the, the the beauty of it is it's not always live so you can re-record things I've, I've of have re-recorded a couple of sections where having listened to it i thought no that uh, i just mucked that up completely i just need to add add a section into that um so i have had to go back and do that and uh yeah the, the good thing is if it's not live you, you've got the opportunity to do that yeah so when you say you're re- recording with your team and solo was that before episode one then so that wasn't part of oh, yeah. what you were releasing yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. and look at that. That's even before I even considered um, seriously uh, creating a podcast because we would um, prepare webinars for clients, for education, uh, for marketing. Um, but before I even started doing them live was actually practising um, speaking to myself or speaking to the team and delivering to them um, and then just reviewing you know what went well what didn't go well uh, understanding how the the technology works because I remember one webinar I tend to wave my hands a bit when I get excited and I just wave my hands and somehow I hit the escape key on my keyboard and the whole presentation dropped out off the oh. screen and I'm just trying to you know recover where I was up to reopening the presentation and starting trying to find my spot. So I got a bit flustered with that, but you know, just learning, turn off the, any notifications, turn off the phone. So it's not going to make noise. Um, even scheduling when you're going to record. So, you know, when, when we're talking tonight, it's, it's nice and quiet in the office. There's nobody, nobody having meetings. There's no maintenance work going on. So just planning when you're going to record as well. Uh, it helps with because uh, you know if you've got a good environment, it's nice and calm, it's nice and quiet. Uh, it's also a lot easier because when you're thinking about the distractions, uh, you tend to get a bit flustered, um, and and maybe yeah you you, you you don't cover all the points as clearly or as um, concisely as you as you need to when when you're um when you're actually recording live. Yeah, yeah, some good tips. Obviously, it's easier for people doing solo podcasts to record whenever they want. If you have an interview podcast, then you kind of got to work with people. But at the same time, if there are times where you know it's just not going to work for you, you don't have to completely bend over backwards and you know record at midnight or whatever. Like I've I've stopped recording at, um, interviews at Friday afternoon now because I know I just don't have as much energy at that time of yeah. the week. Um, yeah, absolutely. But obviously, you've got to be a little bit flexible. Oh, look, and the other thing is that, look, there will be a time when technology fails. Yeah. Um, there will be a time that technology fails. And, and look, we've ha- I've had that a couple of times, um, fortunately, with people I, I know quite well, and they've been very accommodating in re-recording the episode. We were using one tool that we were, well, we trialed it, we'd used it a couple of times, and then we decided to, to reuse it. And and every our audio just kept dropping out every 30 seconds. Um, uh, even though we're actually recording in the same office on the same cable internet, uh, that just didn't work. And you know, um, I think the other thing is, if you're going to try, if you're going to use some new piece of technology, test it before you use it with a lot with um, a, an interview guest. Um, but uh, look at the, you know, I, I mentioned that we record with Zencaster when we do remote recordings, and one of the things I love about it is if somebody's internet drops out, it actually records each person individually on their local computer and then combines the files at the end and we've had that that instance happen uh, a couple of times where um the the guests i'm interviewing their their audio will drop out and i can't hear them but they're unaware that they've dropped out so they just keep talking and then at the end of it when we're listening to it there's no evidence that any of the files have dropped uh, any of the audio has dropped out so that's that's um, one of the reasons I, I really enjoy using zencaster apart from the fact that i don't have to be a sound engineer at the end of the at the end of the episode yeah so as a chartered accountant and business advisor i just wanted to ask you a couple of questions for any podcasters listening who are just starting creating content online and they want to make a business out of it and maybe they don't really know where to start 
and what to do with their money once it starts coming in. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how it works in Australia. And just looking at forums and, and groups and things, I think a lot of people, they start making content on YouTube and podcasts and things. They start getting a bit of ad revenue and it just goes straight into their personal bank account. And that's that. They don't really think about the business side of it or the tax side of it. And I just wondered if you had any kind of tips for a solo entrepreneur starting to make content, starting to make, you know, a few hundred quid a month or a few hundred dollars a month, a couple of things that maybe they need to remember or think about when they're just starting up as a, a solopreneur? Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, look, if you if it's the question is, is, is it a hobby or is it a business? That's that's the first question that, that we often get asked. And, and whether it's uh, the creator economy or even um, whether it's a craft economy that you, you're using, um, the key question in Australia is, is it a hobby or a business? Because often with a hobby, your expenses are far in excess of your um, of your revenue. Yeah. Um, because you tend to invest a lot more in it and there's rules about how much you can claim as a tax deduction there and whether it's actually a commercial business so there's a few tests there but um look if it is a business if you're running it as a business then one of the key things is keep a separate business account where all of your revenue goes in and all of your expenses are at, um, come out of so it's a lot easier to track and you've got that separation between what is business and what is private um, the other tip i would say is that don't rush out and buy all the latest and greatest gear before um, before you've actually got a few well even 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 after you've got a few episodes under your belt don't don't necessarily rush out and buy the latest and greatest gear because so many people have um, produced some great podcast material out there with with just the bare basics um, obviously uh, a good quality microphone is helpful and you can get one of those for not really expensive i think the microphone um that i i use which is uh, extremely reliable was about 150 dollars australian mm. so not not expensive by any case um but you know you don't have to have all the gear you can use there are a lot of free tools out there so don't over capitalize um at, particularly while you're getting started but you know um be mindful that if you are um, running a business as a creator, a content creator, and you are getting revenue coming in, um, the ATO will be watching you, or well, the Australian Taxation Office will be watching you. And in fact, they've actually been um, quite, um, uh, I guess, prominent in, in, in telling people that if you are part of the creator economy in Australia, that that is a business and that, that, that you do have an obligation to declare your income as part of your tax return. Yeah, I guess things move kind of, slowly in that regard and and the creator economy is relatively a, a new thing um so is, is it more of a recent thing that is starting to sort of crack down on those kind of things yeah yeah so pretty pretty recent but i think um the other area and this is before the creator economy but the the, the australian taxation office does a lot of data sharing with organizations so it was doing data sharing with ebay and paypal um, uh, wow. well before that. So it would say, hey, there's a lot of money flowing through your eBay account. That That's more than what an, just a person selling a few, uh, a few things would be um, generating. Mm. Uh, we think you're running a business. Um, sh yeah, we, we want to see your records. So um, the Australian Taxation Office with the data sharing arrangements it has in place with eBay and PayPal and um, uh, the banks in Australia, um, they know a lot about what's going on. Um, so there's a good chance that, you know, if you're generating a lot of income from your um, creative activities, um, the ATA will find out. Yeah. Yeah, I did hear about recently about eBay sort of cracking down on things like that. And yeah, I about creating a separate bank account as well. I think I still have, I have, I have friends who are now full-time in their business. It's their only source of income, but they still uh, only have that one account and it does make things difficult mm. and then obviously a lot of podcasters are gonna be producing content just as a side thing to their business so it won't be their main source of income are you monetizing your podcast in any other way or do you track the sort of monetization of the podcast and i know it can be hard with certain things to know if a client has come to you from the podcast or not but is there any way that you track that 
Um, look, uh, the, look, we we do have a little bit of affiliate um, affiliate links, uh, which, okay. to be honest, it's never going to cover the costs. Uh, the way that we're running the podcast, I know a lot of people do do make uh, sizable amounts of uh, revenue from their affiliate activities, um, but that's not the focus for us. In terms of can we track clients that have come from the podcast? Uh, what we've actually found is that the the other professionals who are more likely to refer clients to us, um, so focusing on the the strategy and the advice, um, do so after they have become aware of all the activities and, and our expertise. And and the podcast is another way of showing that we are actually experts and we we do focus on the strategy and growing businesses and and we don't just talk about it. We actually do it with our clients. So we have had some of our clients on the podcast that we've interviewed some of their success stories. Um, so it's sort of not just one thing that's brought clients to the business. It, it's a combination, but certainly um, not every accountant in Australia is running a podcast. Um, so it's it sort of, it is a, a bit of a unique selling point for us in that we're, we're doing that and we're providing some content which is not tax-based or um, compliance-based, but actually helping business owners um, yeah, grow get stronger businesses, um, you know, provide resources that they don't have access to um, as a sole trader or even just a, a small company. Yeah, yeah, and I guess it, even though you do get listeners around the world, it is a little bit of a selling point, like you say, that that you're coming to it from a, an Australian angle. Yeah, some of the concepts we, we try and deal with, though, um, I, I guess um, they're not necessarily unique to Australia. They're not necessarily unique uh, issues. Um, sometimes we'll talk about how it applies in Australia, uh, but often, yeah, um, there's still business risk insurance in different countries. There's still the same HR issues in different countries. The legislation might be different, so we don't all, well, we'll try to avoid getting um, too focused on the actual Australian legislation, but a lot of the concepts, um, yeah, they can be applied whichever country you're operating a business in. Uh, and that's also one of the aspects that we, we try and, and focus on. We want it to be accessible by anybody anywhere. Um, so a lot of the concepts um, are really transferable across um, um, different countries. Mm. And then just a couple more things. In terms of promotion, you said that ideally your guests will share the episodes that's not always something you can control. So what are the things that you can control that the ways that you're sharing each episode and bringing more listeners in? Yeah, so we'll share it across socials, uh, different social medias. So um, yeah, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, uh, YouTube. So we've now been putting all the episodes or, or going back and putting all our back episodes up on YouTube. But all right. the most recent episodes are on YouTube and we'll do shorts and reels. We're starting to do a lot more of that. Um, we promote across the different organisations that we're involved with locally. Um, we've 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 started doing some meetups with with some of our listeners and and guests so we had one uh last year where we got a bunch of uh listeners and guests in um and we actually recorded a live episode uh with a bit of q a there and we got to get to meet um some listeners that we you know weren't weren't aware of we didn't know that they were listeners before um and they they came along but they also gave us some feedback about some of the content that they would like to see or sorry like to hear on the podcast going forward so it was a good way to do that we're probably looking to do a couple more of those kinds of meetups and maybe some virtual ones um to to to, to utilize um yeah some of the the guests that are willing to to be involved who are based in other states in australia um but uh, yeah, we definitely definitely enjoyed the aisle, the whole idea, that that community idea around the podcast uh, when we had the meetup. So that was really um, an exciting time for us. Yeah, that's a really nice idea because you can call it a community, but the podcasting apps don't exactly allow you to or allow listeners to interact with each other unless they're listening on YouTube, where you've got comments and it's all. But everything, nothing's sort of all in one place. Even the reviews are. Se uh, sort of separated between platform so turning it into an, a proper community bringing people in and and speaking to them is yeah i think that's something that a lot of podcasters could consider which is great mm. and is there anything finally that you wish you'd have known four years ago when you started 
that would have that would have helped keep things going a bit more smoothly for the podcast? I th- I think um, one of the struggles we've had is getting like a like a consistency of good quality guests. Um, and, and it's not because people don't aren't, aren't willing to, to come on and be interviewed on a podcast. What we found though is, is it's, they've said yes, but they've got busy and it's not their priority. So we, unless you follow it up, sometimes, um, you know, they might say yes, but you don't actually get to interview them for another six months. So yeah. if we could, if we could rely or consistently have, you know, six to eight episodes pre-recorded in advance, um, that would be helpful. We've, we have tried to do a couple of batch days where we've just recorded a whole batch of interviews and that's worked well, but um, the, the, you know, uh, the first time we got a number of interviews done in, in, a, in a couple of days, so that fed us for the next three months. And then when we tried to replicate that process, we, we, we heard crickets, nobody was available, it wasn't a good time. Um, so we ended up being, being short. But I think the other thing is that it's um, realise you've got some limits. I think one of the things was that we were trying to do a lot of work. We were trying to do a lot of new things and we probably pushed ourselves a bit hard and we got to a point where we were a bit tired um, and we thought we had to just keep playing through. But we, what we, we did was we gave ourselves permission to have some breaks um, and just refresh. And, and when we did have those breaks and refresh, we sort of revisited where we wanted to go with the next um, – yeah, you know, six months of, of programming and, you know, who would be good to have on and what could we do differently? What could we make it a bit easier for us to get the episodes out and, yeah, you know, just make it a, a more enjoyable experience? Yeah, because consistency is obviously really important and getting the episodes out there and, and you know, weekly is going to help your podcast grow faster. But at the same time, if you're completely burnt out and you end up just giving up, then it's not worth it. So that's, uh, yeah, a nice tip for people who are struggling a bit with with the burnout. But yeah, I really appreciate you giving your time up to speak with me today. And I'm sure this is going to be really helpful for for any podcaster, especially those, you know, running their podcast as part of their business. So anyone listening, if you want to have a listen to the business behind your business, you can find it. I'm assuming it's wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, and now YouTube, of course, which is great. And there's a lot of bite-sized episodes, so it's nice to just go in. Yeah, they're evergreen, like Paul was saying, so you can just jump in and find one that sounds like it might be helpful and, and give it a go. But um, yeah, I really appreciate it again. So thank you, Paul, and uh, I hope you. Uh, I hope everything goes well for the podcast in 2024. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Joe. It's really appreciated and glad I could, uh, yeah, jump on and um, share what we've learnt. Because um, yeah, we've learnt from other people. Happy to happy to repay, pay that back to other people who are just starting or on a different level or a different stage of their journey with podcasting. Nice one. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for listening to Podcasting Amplified. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to follow or subscribe on your favourite podcast platform. We'll be back next time with another conversation offering more insights to take your podcast to the next level and help you to achieve success. Happy podcasting.